Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This is the second video where we're going to talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at the specific biochemical mechanism that leads to death of neurons. Remember that in ALS, there are two types of neurons that die. The first are the upper motor neurons that originate in the motor cortex of the brain, and then the second type are their corresponding lower motor neurons uh, that go through the brainstem and the spinal cord and eventually reach out to innervate skeletal muscle. And so with ALS, when these neurons die, we lose control of skeletal muscle, which causes weakness initially, eventually leading to paralysis. Now, the biochemical mechanism is going to largely involve the formation of structures called inclusion bodies. Inclusion bodies are abnormal aggregates of specific proteins. For example, the three most common that we observe in ALS are aggregates of TDP43, SOD1, or FUS. Now, what is a protein aggregate? Well, we have genes that encode proteins, right? And the genes have specific sequences of nucleotides that encode specific sequences of amino acids. And assuming that the gene is healthy and non-mutant, then the protein is also going to be healthy and non-mutant. But what happens if there is a genetic anomaly in the gene encoding one of these proteins? Well, then the gene sequence is changed, and potentially the amino acid sequence in the protein is changed. And whenever you change structure, you change function. And one of the dysfunctions of these proteins is that they misfold. They don't fold correctly, and so their three-dimensional shape is altered. And so these misfolded proteins actually stick to one another. So initially, you might have one misfolded protein, and then you have a second one that sticks to that one, and a third one that sticks to those two, a fourth one that sticks to those three, and so on and so forth, and you get larger and larger aggregations of proteins, and these aggregations are called inclusion bodies. Sometimes they're referred to as prions, especially if they're able to move from one cell and infect other cells, which is what we actually see in ALS, and we'll explain that in a few minutes. Now, this genetic mutation could be passed on from parent to offspring. That's about 5 to 10 percent of cases or the remainder of them, it could be caused by some trigger in the environment that induces a mutation in these genes, and then you end up with the same problem. What those environmental triggers are exactly are unknown. However, what is known is that these gene mutations can cause misfolded proteins, which then cause aggregates of proteins to form called inclusion bodies, and these inclusion bodies then accumulate in the cytoplasm of motor neurons, and that actually induces their death. Let's see how that occurs now. So this figure contains three types of cells. Right here in blue, this large cell with the axon, this is of course our motor neuron. Then we have two glial cells. The one down here is a support cell called an astrocyte, and the one up here is an immune cell called microglia. The first mechanism of motor neuron death in ALS involves something called glutamate-mediated excitotoxicity. So this neuron that we can see all of it, this is the postsynaptic neuron, and this one that we can only see the end of, this is the presynaptic neuron. And we know that in synaptic transmission, the presynaptic neuron will release a neurotransmitter, in this case glutamate, which will then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell, in this case the postsynaptic neuron, and it will induce some effect. This glutamate will not stay in the synapse indefinitely. It's going to have to be gotten rid of somehow. And one of those methods normally is glutamate will be taken up into astrocytes, and then the astrocytes will degrade glutamate. It will basically get rid of it from the synapse and then metabolize it in some way. And in order to get from the synapse into the cytoplasm of the astrocyte, it has to use a transport protein of some kind. But what would happen if this transport protein was mutant in some way? Well, then this transport protein probably is not going to function, and it's going to have trouble getting glutamate out of the snaps and into the astrocyte. And so that's what we're assuming here, is that this protein, this transporter for glutamate, is mutant. And so if it's mutant, 
Glutamate cannot be reuptaken into the astrocyte, and so glutamate levels will accumulate to abnormally high levels in the synapse. And that's why you see this really thick arrow right here. So there's going to be a lot of glutamate there that's binding to receptors on this postsynaptic neuron. Now, normally, when glutamate binds to receptors, it triggers the opening of calcium channels, and so calcium rushes into the cytoplasm of the motor neuron. Now, one thing that's important to understand is that when there's excessively high levels of calcium inside a cell, that cell exhibits what we call excitotoxicity. Basically, there's so much calcium that for whatever reason, it causes that cell to die. And so with excessive glutamate here in the synapse, there's going to be excessive calcium influx into this motor neuron, and that motor neuron will experience excitotoxicity and die. And so if we have this mutant transport protein that prevents the clearance of glutamate from the synapse, that can lead to that excitotoxicity. And as you can see, that mechanism does not involve prion proteins. However, these other mechanisms do. And so we're going to talk about those now. So number two right here is mutant protein aggregation to what we call prions. Prions are basically just these protein aggregates that can potentially infect other cells. We'll talk about that. So this yellow circle right here, this is our original mutant protein. Remember we have a mutant gene that encodes one of those proteins like SOD1 or FUS, right? And so when we have this mutant protein that misfolds, it tends to stick with other proteins like it. And so you end up with this large protein aggregate of a bunch of SOD1 proteins that are misfolded or a bunch of FUS proteins that are misfolded, right? And this is basically your prion. Now I don't have it shown here, but this prion right here is actually not originally outside of the motor neuron. It's actually originally inside the motor neuron, and while it's in there, it causes all sorts of chaos and dysfunction. It causes the cell to enter oxidative stress. Eventually, it just kills the motor neuron. And once this motor neuron is dead, you could think of it basically leaks its contents because the cell dies. And so the prion then escapes, and that's why it's out here now. This prion can then go and infect other motor neurons. And actually, the fact that prions uh, can propagate from cell to cell explains why ALS can begin in one focal area, one small area of the nervous system, and spread to others. The other thing that these prions can do is they can actually activate these glial cells. So remember that microglia are immune cells. So the prions can activate the microglia, and this will actually change the microglia's metabolism. And as a result, the microglia starts releasing noxious chemicals, basically initiating an inflammatory response. And this axon right here, or really the neuron in general, just gets caught in the crossfire and ends up being collateral damage. So these noxious chemicals, which are products of that inflammatory reaction, they basically start attacking the axon here, and then that leads to the death of the neuron. In the same way, these prions can also activate astrocytes. The astrocytes, again, will function in a very similar manner to the microglia. They will also start releasing noxious chemicals, which can augment the immune response. And again, those noxious chemicals will start attacking the axon of this motor neuron. And so what happens is you go from this normal looking neuron right here with healthy myelin sheaths, right? to what we have over here, a sclerotic neuron. Notice that the myelin sheaths are tremendously damaged due to the noxious chemicals released from the microglia and the astrocyte. And you can imagine that this neuron is going to be inefficient at transmitting an action potential, and in this case it's going to skeletal muscle. And so relative to a normal neuron, where we have a decent contraction of the skeletal muscle, with a nerve that experiences this sclerosis as a result of ALS, that muscle is not going to be able to contract as well. And so that's why initially we see weakness in ALS. Eventually, these neurons will not just be sclerosed, they will actually just completely die. And so when that happens, there's no neuron innervating that skeletal muscle, and so that skeletal muscle is not able to contract, and that's what basically leads to the paralysis associated with ALS. And this is partly why the disease is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The sclerosis comes from the fact that the neurons literally sclerose. Uh, they harden because of excessive damage due to these inflammatory chemicals.
the amyotrophic refers to the fact that it's not changes in the muscle. A usually means not or without. Myotrophic means structure of the muscle, more or less. And so it's not changes in the muscle structure. It has totally to do with the neurons that innervate the muscle, whether it be lower motor neuron directly or upper motor neuron indirectly. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the biochemical mechanism that leads to cell death in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.